thank you all. Thank you all for being here. It's, it's been an honor and a privilege to speak to you. And uh, I really enjoyed the retreat so far. How about you? So let's bring this to closure by talking about how do we get to a vegan world by 2026. So we know we have to get to a vegan world. Okay, so it's, if you look at all the questions that we normally ask, who, what, where, when, why, and how, we know who has to do it. It's us. Where do we have to do it? All over the world. When do we have to do it? Now. By 2026, for sure. <laughs> now would be great, of course. Why do we have to do it? I'll go into that a little bit. I'll show you why we need to do this as quickly as possible. We literally have no choice. Okay? We have no choice. We are being called to shine our light and make sure that the world goes vegan as quickly as possible. So the question is, how do we do it? Okay, so that's the main question I'm going to be addressing. And I'm a systems engineer, as uh, Judy pointed out. And they say that in genuine systems analysis is not about finding solutions. It's really about understanding. Okay? So when you understand the problem correctly, then the solution just presents itself. So, as a systems engineer, I tend to take things from others. I'm actually standing on the shoulders of so many people who have done all the work, and I'm just putting it together. Okay? That's what I do as a systems engineer. I put it together and see if it makes sense. And how does it make sense, and what do we need to do based on our understanding of it? So I have many, many teachers that I need to acknowledge. I'm showing you one of them. One of my main teachers is my granddaughter. Something we did when she was born, I mean, when she was born, I was pretty depressed about the environment because I had been studying it for five years and I thought we were going to hell in a handbasket, you know? That was it. There was nothing I could do. I thought we were the only species that does not belong on Earth. Every other species just lives and the planet thrives. And we just live and the planet dies. So I thought if we just take human beings out, the planet will be fine, right? So we are an ecological mistake. That was my understanding of human beings. We are the only ecological mistake on this planet. And when I came to see her, uh, my granddaughter, when she was a month old, I held her in my arms for the first time. And she looked up at me and she smiled. And you know, and in her smile, it was a very knowing smile. She was like looking at me saying, what do you mean I don't belong? I belong exactly as I am. You're a fool. You don't know what you're talking about, right? And I realized that she must be right, that I'm not telling the right story. And we start looking at things differently, maybe, we do belong exactly as we are and that, that we just need to be doing something now based on our understanding of it. So that's how I started writing Carbon Dharma. I, as soon as I went back from seeing her, I started writing that book. It poured out of me. And it was a way of telling, looking at the story in which we do belong exactly as we are. And, but we are transforming from our caterpillar phase to the butterfly phase. And that's what's happening right now, okay? And it needs to happen very quickly. You can't have the chrysalis stay there for a long time. Then the butterfly will die. So we are in the chrysalis phase. In fact, COVID-19 has put us in the chrysalis phase of humanity. Okay, so... But I want to show you some connections. And this is... Today is actually Gandhi's birthday. And Gandhi was fighting colonialism. Right? I mean, that was his life's work. He was working on fighting colonialism. When we think about colonialism, we think about it as one set of people going over to another land and conquering them and making them do things they don't want to do and taking away their stuff. This is colonialism 1.0. You know, this is what Gandhi had, was fighting. Right? This is what he was encountering. 
and we went we went through this and we got over it we got over it in the 1940s and 50s and 60s a lot of countries got independence from the colonial powers is that because they all had a sudden attack of conscience in the 1940s and 50s or did they figure out something that we don't know so that's what i'm going to show you so what happened was they figured out a different way of doing colonialism okay that's really what happened so if you think about it in 1970 the uh, european economic commission uh, and the world food program funded operation flood in india and the idea behind operation flood was to help indians get more dairy and animal foods in their diet okay so the way they did that was they gave them the know how of how to collect milk put them in refrigerated trucks and bring them from the villages to the cities to sell to people in the cities so this was a way of converting the biomass in the forests of india into cash that can then be used for foreign exchange so it was all men you know disguised in the form of economic growth okay to help india grow its economy the european union was a uh, european economic commission was helping them grow their dairy industry now why would you grow the dairy industry in india most indians are lactose intolerant or i'd rather we should call it lactose normal right <laughs> So most of us are lactose normal and yet you can see you know this was the focus the focus was on dairy growing the dairy industry So to me this is colonialism 2.0 What happened in India was colonialism 2.0 and you can see actually Prince Charles was there you know examining the um dairy operations in there So carnism and colonialism are tied together carnism is how we grow the footprint on nature and when we grow the footprint on nature we extract from nature and we collect turn that all into so called wealth and then we funnel it to the top that's colonialism this is how we extract from other lands so if you think about the fertile crescent the fertile crescent is now this desert the sahara desert okay that's where the ancient civilizations of the world were and the ancient civilization suddenly turned into a desert the desert that that goes from the western edge of africa and all the way into china as the gobi desert and all the way into india as the thar desert and this is because of animal agriculture animal agriculture is about extracting from the land and funneling wealth to the top In order to study the environmental problems I went to this village in Rajasthan India it's on the edge of the Thar desert because at the edge of the Thar desert you can study climate change you can study biodiversity loss you can study ecosystems collapse all of the environmental problems in one spot so I went there to see what was going on and this is the village of Karach and I found that the villagers there were um basically losing their livelihoods in the village they had to pretty much migrate to the cities to earn a living and it was mainly because they were raising animals for food okay so in that village we actually convinced them to protect 250 acres of common land by putting a stone fence and preventing animals from going in there and this was 2002 and by 2006 you can see the forest can come back right you just take the animals out and the forest comes back i went to this village in 2008 i took this picture of the stone fence to the right of the fence animals could not graze and to the left they were allowed to graze and i went vegan on the spot I had this instant realization that it was my consumption of dairy that was causing that forest to die because I could see all these old cows walking around eating anything new on the ground 
And so literally, you know, this is how we are extracting the wealth of the forest, the biomass of the forest, and turning it into cash. And India is now the largest exporter of beef in the world, or either the largest or the second largest exporter of beef. And that is the largest source of foreign exchange for them. This is how they can buy oil. If you don't have dollars, you cannot buy oil. So this is how through the economic system that we are colonizing the world. If you look closely at what is happening among the corporations of the world, you will see that the preferred shares in all these major corporations, whether it's big pharma or big meat or big chem or big media or big banks, you'll see the same four financial holding companies as major stockholders. And these four financial holding companies are Fidelity, Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street. And if you try to see who owns these four financial holding companies, it's a secret. Because they're all private holding companies and they don't have to share their st stockholders. So we don't know who they are. Just a few people literally are running the whole planet because they control all these corporations and through these corporations they control our political system as well. So we are all pretending to fight when in reality we are all answering to the same, to the same uh, holders, right? So this is the colonial game of empire and the corporations are running it. And it is run by the currency system. So the colonial currency system is the mechanism by which colonization happens. So the way it happens is, the only people who can generate currency are banks. And we know who the banks are owned by. It's by the same for financial holding companies. Now, how do banks create currency? When you go deposit money in the bank, the bank only has to keep 10% of that money. The other 90% it lends out. This is called a fractional reserve currency system. And when it lends out that money, it insists that you pay that money back and along with it, interest. So then you have to go and grow the economy in order to give back that money to the bank. Okay? So through this mechanism, now banks can create currency and if, if you at some point say, I cannot return that money because you know, I had a flood in my home, they're going to come and take away your assets. So they don't side with you against the bank. It's always, the state is always on the side of the banks. This is how colonialism is enforced through the state mechanism. Okay? This is what uh, Paul Ehrlich calls the global ecological Ponzi scheme that we are running on this planet. See, ultimately as human beings, we coordinate our actions among millions and billions of us by telling common stories and playing common games. So the story of money is a story, right? And then the game of money is the rules by which we create money and the rules by which we exchange, right? So through this game, we have created an ecological Ponzi scheme from which we are extracting from nature and funneling wealth to the top. So the way we grow the economy right now, we monetize everything so that when dead trees have more economic value than living trees, we cut down trees. When dead animals have more economic value than living animals, we kill all the animals. And when sick people have more economic value than healthy people, we sicken people. We endanger life on earth now, especially because of all the environmental issues we have caused. We addict everyone into compulsive behaviors, and this is what all these advertisements are all about. We lie to ourselves. We tell lies to our children in their textbooks. The protein myth and the calcium myth, these are all deliberate lies that are told to our children. And finally, we steal from the poor to enrich the rich. It's a reverse Robin Hood system, okay? So literally, I mean, I went to a store to buy a pound of organic basmati rice and it cost me two dollars. Then I traced it to find the farmer who grew that rice in India and she got paid five cents a pound for that. 
and the rest is considered profit because it's a capitalist system, it's whatever the market can bear. So this is how we use the labor of the poor in order to enrich the rich. And now, of course, India is eating more and more animal foods. As a result of this, as a result of making more and more Asians eat more and more animal foods and you know, the growing the whole uh, animal agriculture industry, we are literally killing the planet. Okay? Between 1970 and 2010, we wiped out 52% of all wild vertebrates on this planet by total weight. So in 40 years, okay? between 1970 and 2010, that 52% became 58% by 2012. And it became 68% by 2016. So we are on track to wipe out 100% of all wild animals, wild vertebrates, by 2026. This is why I say we don't have a choice. We have to turn the world vegan by 2026. Yes. We don't have a choice. We have to do it. So shine brightly, please. You have a light. You are showing a light. Okay? You are going to now go and influence others. You're going to tell them the story. Tell them this is really what's going on. We are being colonized by a few people into playing a game that we know is terribly unfair. And in the process we are killing off the planet, I mean, come on. We can do, we can do better than that. This is why a global transformation is inevitable. It's going to happen. Either voluntarily or involuntarily. We're going to have to do this. Okay? And so it's the pervasive human-driven decline of life that's pointing to the need for transformative change. That's what biologists are telling us. It's not climate change. Climate change is not the first thing that's going to make us do it. It's what we are doing to life. So a global transformation is inevitable. It's a question of how do we do it. Think about it, right? Here is nature telling us stop. That's what COVID-19 was. Nature is telling us stop it. You're done with this mode of living. So she, literally she put us in the chrysalis phase. So think about what you're doing and come back out as a better human beings. And we decided to treat slaughterhouses as critical infrastructure. I mean, how serious are we at dealing with this crisis? So, I mean, our governments are not going to do this for us, okay? It's up to us to do this. This is why I want to show you this uh, you, Sustainable Development Goals of the UN. Because this corruption goes all the way to the top, everywhere. Okay? The entire system is geared towards the old model, towards growing the economy at all costs. So if you look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals, I mean, goal number one, no poverty. Who could argue with that? Of course we want no poverty. Goal number two, zero hunger. Of course we want that. You know, every one of those goals looks good, except when you come to goal number eight and you say, why is that there? Why do we need economic growth? If you meet the other goals, do you really care that some number is growing somewhere? So that is put in there in order to maintain the Ponzi scheme. Because a Ponzi scheme collapses if it doesn't grow. Every Ponzi scheme collapses if it doesn't grow. So that's why they put it in there, so that they can pretend to address all the goals even though their only objective is to preserve the Ponzi scheme. Okay? Because they are stuck in a system that's based on a couple of false axioms. What is an axiom? An axiom is something that we take as the truth. That we don't have to think about it. It's, the, it's truth. Okay? It's accepted as the truth. And this is accepted as the truth in our current civilization. The axiom of consumerism. This is why we don't blink an eye when we see 3,000 ads a day. Right? Because we have taken this to be true. The false axiom of consumerism, which is that the pursuit of happiness is best accomplished by stoking and satisfying a never-ending series of latent desires in human beings. And there is not a single religion in the world that will tell you that this is true. Okay? Every religion will tell you this is false. We have epics about this, saying this is false. Uh, yet, our civilization is based on this truth. 
this false axiom. It's a little bit like when Galileo said, you know, the sun does not go around the earth, the earth goes around the sun. They threw him in jail, right? But if he hadn't overcome that axiom, there would have been no scientific revolution. Because you can't have the theory of gravity or anything like that if you keep thinking that the sun goes around the earth. So we had to overcome that false axiom in order to make progress. In the same way, we cannot have a sustainable civilization until we overcome our false axioms. This is one. Okay? So I say we are in a double Galileo moment because we have to overturn two false axioms, not just one. The false axiom of consumerism and the false axiom of supremacism. The false axiom of supremacism says that life is a competitive game in which those who have gained an advantage may possess, enslave and exploit animals, nature and the disadvantaged for their pursuit of happiness. So you may have gained an advantage because you are the right species. You may have gained an advantage because you have the right skin color or the right um, sex. sex. Right? So based on that advantage, yeah, you, you then figure out how to win in this game. That's the game we are playing right now, right? This is called the might is right rule. And these two false axioms are coded in these two machines that we have built that's destroying the planet. The first machine is the burning machine, which is burning all these fossil fuels and uh, industry. And that is to implement the false axiom of consumerism primarily. Okay? And the second is the killing machine, which is implementing the false axiom of supremacism. So these two machines are literally destroying the planet. Okay? So we, we have to shut them both down. But the way the current system is framing it, they're framing it to say the problem is not the axioms. The problem is that this burning machine is using fossil fuels. If we just switch that over to electricity, solar energy and wind energy, we'll be fine. Okay? So to do that, they're misdirecting us. They're telling us, don't look at the killing machine at all. Just focus on the burning machine. So they're misdirecting us by, first of all, ignoring all the other environmental problems and only focusing on climate change. Okay? That's the first misdirection that happens. Because if you look at the other environmental problems, whether it's nitrogen loading or phosphorus loading or genetic biodiversity, biodiversity loss, you will see that the killing machine is the leading cause of all of those. So they focus on just climate change, which happens to be just yellow in this case, you know. You can see that when you color code something as red, red is bad. Yellow is not so bad, right? So in this case, yellow is not so bad, but they are focusing on just climate change because they are showing that the killing machine is not the leading cause of it. You see these black dots? The black dots represent the role of agriculture in causing that problem. But that's actually a framing that they've done. It's actually um, using conventions that they cooked up in order to make it look like the burning machine is the leading cause of climate change. When you actually analyze it closely, you will see that the killing machine is also the leading cause of climate change. Why? Because the killing machine is using so much land just to raise the animals. Okay? So, if you look at the total amount of food we eat, we eat about 1.5 billion tons of food, dry weight, per year. 85% of that is already plant-based. Okay? Only 15% comes from animal foods. So, 12% comes from land animals, and to get that 12% of the food, we are using 43% of the land area of the planet. So the plant-based foods, 85% of the food that we eat, comes from just 6% of the land area of the planet. Just think about it. So here we are, you know, we have a, we have a huge problem that can be easily solved if everyone went vegan. Yes. It's so simple, right? When you think about it, it's so simple. And it's good for our health, it's good for the animal's health, it's good for the planet. And to get 3% of our food from the ocean, we are literally destroying the entire ocean, just, just for 3% of the food. 
But if you look at all the subsidies from the governments, it's going to animal foods. Worldwide, worldwide we are, um, there was an estimate that came out just a week ago saying that we are giving about $540 billion in subsidies to the animal agriculture industry. And in return, the animal agriculture industry is causing 12 to $14 trillion worth of damage every year. Right? And at that rate, you can take all the money that we have all collected worldwide, all the wealth of the planet, and you can't even use that to repair what we have done, what that industry has done. So if you take the land use, uh, the opportunity cost of the land use into account, it turns out that animal agriculture is the leading cause of climate change as well. It's responsible for at least 87% of the greenhouse gas emissions every year if you take into account the opportunity cost. So I actually, we formulated a um, bathtub challenge to help students understand how to solve this problem. Okay? So in the bathtub challenge, this is, this is an exact equivalent of what's happening in climate change. Okay? So here, you're a plumber. And you have to save the baby from the bathtub. Okay? The baby is stuck in the bathtub. You can't take the baby out because baby represents all life on earth. Okay? And the bathtub is filled up with a thousand liters of water, which corresponds to the thousand gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent that we've added to the atmosphere. Okay? And it's being filled in by two faucets. The burning machine faucet is pouring 35 liters per minute, and the killing machine faucet is pouring 15 liters per minute into the bathtub. And the formulation is that if the bathtub has 1,200 liters of water, the baby will drown. So which means if we don't do anything in four minutes, the baby is going to drown. Each minute roughly represents one year. Okay? So in four years, we are on track to wipe out almost all lives. So the baby is going to drown. When you shut off the burning machine faucet, for every one liter per minute you turn off the burning machine faucet, there will be 10 liters pouring from the aerosol tank into the bathtub. So that's the cooling that the fossil fuel industry is causing right now. Okay? There's about one third cooling that's happening in the atmosphere. So meaning if you turn off the fossil fuel industry right away, you're actually going to heat up the earth by another one third. And the baby will drown. Okay, so, which means if you turn it off completely, you will get 350 liters into the bathtub and the baby will drown because it's more than 1200 liters. But the killing machine faucet is pouring 15 liters per minute into the bathtub and it's connected to the drain. So for every one liter per minute that you turn off the killing machine faucet, it's going to open the drain by two liters per minute. So if you shut off the killing machine faucet right away, you're going to reduce the flow from 50 liters per minute to 5 liters per minute. Because you're going, to, you're going to shut off the 15 liters and you're going to open 30 liters. So you have 35 liters coming in, 30 liters going out. So it's only going to fill up at 5 liters per minute. But still the baby will drown in 40 minutes. Okay? But if you turn off the killing machine faucet and then start turning down the burning machine faucet, you can actually save the baby and drain the bathtub. So that's what we are asking students to figure out. Okay, how would you do it? What is the optimum way to do it? Okay, so that you can save the baby and drain the bathtub without filling up the vegan reforestation tank. The vegan reforestation tank has a capacity of 2,000 liters. So we can do this. So that's the idea behind this challenge, is that there is a way to solve climate change but our governments are doing the exact opposite of what they should be doing. But we can do this ourselves. And um, when my granddaughter was four years old, she made me go and watch Cinderella with her. And, <laughs> and I realized it was for me, not for her. <laughs> because I learned three things when I was watching Cinderella. Three things that Cinderella said. And I said, that pretty much sums up what we need to do. Okay? Have courage, be kind, and all will be well. Have courage and be kind to all life, and all will be well. 
Second thing she said was, just because it's what is done, doesn't mean it is what should be done. So you have to question our traditions and our culture and, and say that things have changed now. Circumstances are different. And we need to be doing some things differently. And third is imagine the world as it should be and work towards it. Right? So we want a vegan world. Clearly that's what nature is calling for as well. So it's up to us to step up and take it to the next level in our activism to make it happen. And Buckminster Fuller said, you know, if you want to build something, right, never, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. Change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So just like they have a game that allows them to do uh, what they're doing, we have to create a new game. We have to create a new game and we have to base it on the correct axioms. So, so the correct axioms, the true axiom of inner peace, which is that the pursuit of happiness is best accomplished by looking for it within ourselves. This is something that we all knew all along, that we were going along with what they were doing, right, so far. But we need to say no, you know, we have to look inwards for happiness, not out there. And second, which is very appropriate for this forum, is the true axiom of unity, which is that all life is one family in which we each bring our unique skills to give all we can, receive all we need, and become all we are. This is the vitality code of Shelley Ostroff. So these are the correct axioms on which we need to build our new game. And this is what I call the metamorphosis analogy. It's going from the caterpillar to the butterfly. No more growth. We are done with the growth model. Okay? There's no, no more growth possible on this planet. So we can't have a Ponzi scheme that has to keep growing. We need to change that. So this is the greatest transformation in human history and we are alive to make it happen. Right, so we are, we are a very lucky generation. No other generation can say this. And it requires us to shift from everything on the left hand side to everything on the right hand side. Just look at everything on the left hand side and tell me what is it that you would like to preserve in that? It's a system of normalized violence. Why would we want to continue that? From normalized violence, we need to create a system of normal non-violence. From competitive finite games, we play competitive finite games and especially using the skin of animals or the, you know, even tennis balls have wool on them, right? And baseballs are made with cowhide. I mean, so we are taking these skins of animals and batting it around to show who's the boss around here. And we play these finite games to see who's a winner and the, all the rest are losers. That's the kind of games we keep playing. Instead, we need to start playing collaborative infinite games. We think we are a predator species, the top predator on the planet. Sorry, if you keep wanting to be the top predator on the planet, you're going to die too. Knowing that, we need to start transforming to a caretaker species. So that's the transformation that's happening. That's what's sustainable. And we need to become Homo Ahimsa, as Judy Carmen has been telling us. Right? So we call ourselves Homo sapiens sapiens. This is, the, this is Latin for the wise, wise hominid. I mean, how much more narcissistic can you get? <laughs> because we are naming ourselves as the wise, wise hominid, right? <laughs> so we are a narcissistic, predatory, taker species at the moment. And we have to become a compassionate, climate-regulating, caretaker species. Because as soon as we acknowledge that we are changing the climate of the planet, we have the responsibility to maintain it on behalf of all life. Okay, so we have a purpose. And all the other animals are looking at us and saying, when is this species going to wake up and do its job? And this is our job, to maintain the climate of the planet. So those are the cultural shifts. Now the civilizational shifts are from speciesism, colonialism, racism, ableism, and patriarchy, all the domination, oppression paradigm, to veganism and radical sacredness, the ahimsa sacred relationships paradigm. From diseases and divisiveness for humanity to health and harmony and diversity for humanity. From destruction and exploitation of the planet 
to regeneration and caretaking of the planet. From violence and cruelty to animals, to kindness and compassion for animals. Okay? From an egocentric culture of consumerism to an egocentric culture of accountability. From a mindset of scarcity to a mindset of generosity. And from a profit-driven economy to a service-driven economy. And guess what? Everything on the left-hand side is designed, built in, in the game of money that we play today. And so all we need to do is to create a new game of money that codes everything on the right-hand side of this. And it can be done. It's not that complicated. So this is what we term the vegan currency. We need to create a new currency system. A vegan currency that allows us to stay within the donut of K. Travers donut economics. So we stay within the bounds of the planet and simultaneously make sure that everyone is outside this the inner hole of the donut. We are working on something called Aquarius, which is a multidimensional like measure of ecological footprint. And it begins by saying, every one of you who is alive already belong. Because in the current game of money, you don't belong at all, unless you do what the colonial master wants. They tell you you had a right to life, and then they tell you you all have to go earn a living. I mean, didn't it occur to us that when you have a right to life, you don't have to go earn a living? But we just, we have been so mesmerized and we bought into this. So here you belong to start with. So you get money flowing into your account, you just have to sit there and come, it shows up. Why? Because you belong. And some of it goes into the pocket of your account. So which means that's, that's something that you get no matter what. Okay? That pulls you out of the inner, inner hole of this donut. So between the inner hole of the donut and the outer, then we create a market economy in that. Okay? So we stay within the bounds of the donut and create a market economy. That's the idea behind this. And ensuring that every one of, that every one of the bounds of the planet is met. It's because we need to create a system, a game, in which we lead our ordinary lives and the planet must thrive. We don't have to go and think about it afterwards, right? It needs to be automatic, built in. But this can only work in an open source economy, an open source economy and ecology. As long as we have secrets, I won't tell you how I'm doing it because I'm making a profit out of it, then we won't know what you're doing. If we don't know what you're doing, then we cannot account for it. So this will only work in an open source economy and ecology. Okay? So that's one, the only thing that's sustainable. But we can create abundance in this. Because so far, over the last 10,000 years, we have cut half the trees on the planet. Just think about it. We've cut half the trees on the planet. So if we bring back the trees that we cut, we can literally reverse climate change. Okay? No question. And in fact, if 0.2% of the trees are mature almond trees, they can replace the 840 million tons of dairy milk we're consuming every year. Just those 0.2% of the trees can replace, can give us all the almond milk we need. Okay? So that's abundance. That's what you're creating with this. So the seven strategic actions we talk about for creating a vegan world is number one is education. We need to tell people that there is this, the greatest transformation in human history that's happening right now, and you need to be part of it. This is not a spectator sport, okay? We all have to contribute to make it happen. Second is we have to tell the UN, we know what you're up to, so please drop this pretense of goal number eight, SDG eight, and replace it with goal number 18, which is zero animal exploitation. Claire Smith had come up with this, you know, or beyond animal. So we need to tell them to adopt the zero animal exploitation, make it explicit that we are going to have a vegan world. That's what we are working towards. Otherwise, they're not, be, they're not on our side. So at least we need to make it clear to them that we know what they're up to, right, by demanding this. Third is, in any systems, um, project that I've been involved in, if I have 17 goals to meet, I pick one goal and I say, let's meet it. 
then we know we are serious about meeting these goals, right? So the easiest among the 17 goals is zero hunger. Let's meet that. If you can't even meet that, let's stop pretending that you're working on it. So we need to get serious about, about doing these things. So I say, let's meet goal number two, food healers. So let's make sure that healthy immune boosting food is available to everybody. Can we not make that happen around the world? Fourth is we need to figure out a new constitution because a new way of organizing ourselves. The old way in terms of dividing ourselves up into nations and then states and cities and then dividing things up, that's not going to work anymore. So it's a bottom-up approach that needs to happen. And a new constitution to heal the planet, we need to come up with this new open source economy game. We have come up, and we, have, we have an idea of how, what to build, but we have, to, we have to now go ahead and build it. And we have to start playing that new game, the game of Aquarius. I need to recruit all of you to join that game, right? Because when more and more of us play the new game, then the old game becomes obsolete. obsolete. Exactly. Sixth is a common spiritual initiative. We have to get together across all religions. This is what unity is about. And say that we are all making this transformation as one family, as one human family. We were one human family in Africa before we split up and spread throughout the world. And we did that in order to prevent the earth from ever going back to another ice age. We did that. Okay, over the last 10,000 years, we made sure that the earth can never go back to another ice age by just cutting down forests. And now we have to bring back those forests in order to survive as a species and bring back the animals that we kill. So that's up to the religions of the world to, because we are very well organized at the grassroots through religions, bringing people together and uh, across, I mean, for this common objective. And finally, we need to create a new ecology, a growing food forest around the world. So we have a new app called United in Heart that allows you to participate in this. So you can download the app. It's now available on iPhones only. But you can download the app and then start participating in creating food forests around the world. So from an individual perspective, I say the number one thing you can be doing is to go vegan as local as possible, as organic as possible. So local, organic, vegan eating, this is love. This is love for the planet, love for yourself, and love for your fellow human beings, and love for the animals. This is job one, right? And then you have to convince others to do the same as well. Because it's like, you know, it's like we are in a house that's burning up, and you are walking around, I mean, you are running around with a bucket trying to put out the fire, and there are others just sitting around smoking away and throwing <laughs> cigarettes around, right? And they're saying, it's my choice to do what I want. No, 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 we're in the same home. <laughs> and our home is burning. Okay, so we have to convince others to, to so it's no longer, uh, you know, okay to say they can do their own way and I'll do my own thing. Secondly, you know, we need to become a conscious, become conscious consumers. So step out of this old game as much as possible. Stop supporting them. So I do this buy everything day. I've been doing this for about 13 years now. And I, um, I, I just make a list on every other day and I go buy everything I need on one day of the year. And usually on that day of the year, I cross out everything I load up anyways. Because <laughs> I really don't need much. Right? And I wind up buying toothbrushes and toothpaste and that's about it. So then you become immune to the advertising that they're trying to do. Okay? So I have a good mind to actually tell all the uh, advertisers who are featured on my YouTube channel and say, look guys, Google is ripping you off because I don't buy any of your stuff. And they're showing me your ads. Third is please join a community and contribute in any way, okay? so. This is just one example. We do a vegan world convergence every three months and we get together and figure out what is the next step we need to do to get to this vegan world. And um, so we meet every January, April, July, and October. And so far it's been online. And so you're welcome to join us. 
The next one is happening October 23rd and 24th. Thank you. Thank you.